the slides will come back up for all of you. So welcome to the talk. My name is Annika Clark and I'm a consultant clinical psychologist at South West London and St George's Mental Health Trust. And I'm also the clinical lead for the children's wellbeing practitioner teams and the mental health support teams in schools across our trust. And many of you might have children who are in schools who are supported by our teams. So the talk today is called Parenting Teens in Times of Uncertainty. And what we're going to be going through are um, much as it said on the flyer, we're going to be looking at sleep, how much teens need, some cycles of behaviour that teenagers and their teens often get caught up in, um, how to best help teenagers hear what we're saying as parents, um, because they quite often switch off to us, then a little bit about how to recognise anxiety and low mood, and then lastly we're going to finish with just thinking about how to respond to these really heightened high levels of emotion that teenagers kind of get stuck in sometimes. And then at the end, we're going to have um, some space for questions. So it's useful to think about how much sleep um, teenagers actually need because many of them don't get enough and sleep is really important for um, learning, but also for behaviour and emotions, how we feel. I mean, all of us know that if we don't get enough sleep, we do not feel at our best and it's no different for teenagers. So if you look at the charts, um, up to the age of 13, the recommended amounts between nine and 11 hours, which uh, will shift depending on individual need. And then as teenagers get a little bit older, 14 to 17, it's still reasonably high. It's uh, between eight and 10 hours. So if you've got a teenager who is pretty much average, will need about nine hours sleep to function and learn well. That would mean going to bed um, by 10 o'clock if they get up at seven. So it just gives you a rough indication of what the recommended daily amount of sleep is for those age groups. So if you've got a teenager who is prone to slipping out of the school routine as soon as it's weekends or holidays, that's fine for the short term, but some teenagers get very much caught where their sleep cycle is out of sync. So they're going to bed really late, then they can't get up in the morning or they're napping during the day. Um, so how do you help them get their sleep back on track? One of the things that most parents always try and do is get their teenagers to go to bed earlier. This can quite often backfire because they're just not tired. So they go to bed, even if they do listen to you and they try to go to sleep, they'll toss and turn, they'll need to get up, they'll be distracted by a screen and they'll still end up going to bed later. It's much, much better to talk to them about getting up at a decent time. And if you force yourself to get up at the time you're meant to in the morning, there is a natural knock on effect that you feel tired much earlier in the evening. So it's the quickest way to get sleep routine back on track is not to go to bed early. It's to get up early and the rest follows um, on course. Now, if you've got a teenager who's done that and they've got up early, they're likely to feel quite tired during the day and want to nap. Napping for anything more than 15 minutes really will undercut all the good work about going to bed early because they're not going to feel tired again in the evening. So try and persuade them to push through, no napping, go to bed early. That's what we'll get back in. Um, it's always good to have a structured routine leading up to bedtime so that they do the same kind of things, whether that's having a shower or reading a bit before bed, really discourage screen time before bed. The blue light that is given off by screens is quite energising and um, can get in the way of um, helping you get to sleep. So a good rule is no screens, including phones for an hour before bedtime. It can be quite hard to enforce this if um, if young people have got used to having their phones around all the time. We'll come on to later how you can try and help teenagers work with you 
to kind of do some of the things they need to do, but it is a good rule to implement where you can or to discuss with them about whether they're happy with their sleep and whether they feel like they're alert and able to attend at school. So these are all sort of the generally recognised best ways of getting sleep on. Obviously, it's a very quick run through, but this will be a good start. One of the things that we're finding parents talking a lot about at the moment are that they, you know, without all the ups and downs and uncertainty of lockdown and COVID at the moment, it's it can be a real struggle for um, parents to get their teenagers to listen to them, to do as they're told, to do some of the things that they need to do. And so before we go into what you can do, to help them listen to you, it's quite useful to have a look at the kind of cycles that are very common for parents to get caught up in, because knowledge is power. If you can recognise what's going on, it gives you the space to think about trying to catching yourself to do something different. So we've got two cycles. Um, two cycles up on the screen here. There's a blue cycle and a green cycle. The blue cycle, if we look at that one first, well, to start with, both cycles follow the same starting point. So you start here with you set a limit or you ask them to do something, we make a request. And if they do it, that's great. If they don't, if they refuse or they ignore you or they misbehave in some way or um, get, you know, get a bit antsy with you, then um, there are two common routes that parents get caught up in. So if we look at the blue route first, what tends to happen when your teenager says no or ignores you is you might have some of these feelings bubble up where you feel like they're getting one over on you, that um, they're out of control, how dare they not listen to you? You might be thinking, I'm really fed up with this. I'm sick of this behaviour. You know, it's not a difficult thing to do. Why aren't they listening to me? You might feel like you're not in charge when you really feel like you should be. Or you might think, right, this is it. I've had enough. And what that leads into is a need to kind of assert your authority. You want them to know that you're the one who's in charge. So you may become a bit punitive. You might threaten to do something or take something away. You might feel the need to punish them because you're feeling quite cross and angry about them not doing what they need to do. Or you might clamp down on things and say, right, well, you're not allowed to do this anymore. Or if you don't do it, then X. And the more angry and the more you feel like you're not in control and in, in charge, the more likely you are to start giving harsher threats or punishments and you sort of up the ante and you might find yourself even threatening or giving punishments that you don't even really want to follow through because they're going to be make your life a bit harder too. Um, and then the outcome of that, there are two outcomes. Um, the teenager either feels resentful, they think, well, you know, that's so unfair, you're a horrendous parent, you don't understand. They may make threats back to you. Um, the situation might get a bit confrontational because they're rising to your anger and they're meeting you at a point where you're angry. So there might be a to and fro of arguing and shouting where you both say some, some things that you might regret. And the upshot of that is that even if they do comply and do what you said at the beginning, they will feel resentful afterwards and they will only remember the punishment and the threats. They won't remember that they, this all started because they didn't do what you asked them to do and it was reasonable. Um, and next time you set a limit, it means that they're automatically going to be in that kind of like, well, I'm not doing what you say, that you, you set something up where they're less likely to comply with you. or. The other option is they might comply out of fear. Just, you know, if your threat is big enough and you look scary enough or angry enough, they might comply just to get you off their back. But that chips away over time at your relationship, which also means that uh, paradoxically, they're less likely to want to do what you say next time you set a limit. The other very common cycle that parents get caught up in is the green cycle, which is 
um, involves more feelings about, you know, oh, I'm just so tired, I can't face it. You know, I know I really should make them do it, but actually what's so bad about just letting them off this time? You know, I really don't want to have to put my foot down. You might be scared of confrontation and just think, actually, I don't have the energy to do this. Or you might feel that you're powerless and you just think, well, I can't stop her anyway, so what's the point? Um, or you might try and convince yourself, well, you know, it's not that bad if they don't do it. And the end result is that you might do a bit of protesting. You might say things like, oh, come on, please, come on, just do it. It's not much to ask. But essentially, both you and your child knows that you're going to give in. And then what happens, of course, is you're setting up a cycle where when you ask them to do something, everybody knows that you're not really going to follow through very much or that it's easy for them to say no. And that leads to a circumstance in which obviously they're less likely to comply next time you set a limit. Now, it's worth saying that both these cycles are really, really common and you might recognise one in yourself more than the other. Most of us as parents are drawn more to one than the other, but it's also very common to jump between them. So, for example, you might naturally be more drawn to the green cycle where we would call that a more permissive style of parenting where you're more likely to let things go and you might go around that green cycle several times but then suddenly you might snap and you just think, actually, I'm a mug. I'm not putting up with this. I'm not going to manage it. I'm not going to let them get away with it anymore. And you'll snap and move into the blue cycle and then become far more feeling the need to assert your authority, be harsh. You might be drawn into given a punishment. But then it the difficulty with that is then you probably will feel guilty afterwards and feel like you've overreacted and then you slip back into your more comfortable green cycle and nothing changes and the other way around too if you're more likely to be drawn to the blue cycle you might go around that a few times and then you might think actually I've just had enough I can't bear it I can't bear all this confrontation you know fine do what you want and then you might slip into the green cycle but then you might feel like you have let things go, but you really need to be in charge. So you jump back into the blue cycle next time. So these are really common. Every parent will have got caught up in one or other of these cycles um, on a reasonably regular basis for most of us. And the reason I'm putting them up is to once you know what your natural tendency is, it can help you really step in at this stage when the teenager refuses to do something or behaves or ignores. And then you have a few choices about what your next step is, but you have to be able to catch yourself to do that. Oops, let's move on to the next slide. Oh dear. Let me just see, I think it might be stuck. Sorry about this. I'm going to have to come back out and go back in again. The slideshow is stuck. There we go. So to summarise, um, the green cycle is usually seen as a more permissive style of parenting. Um, and it might be that traditionally sort of really can't face or don't want that conflict that often comes up between teenagers and parents. So you're drawn to becoming more overly permissive. And the blue cycle is more around feeling like you've got to have some authority and it's a bit more of an old school style of parenting, maybe what we were all brought up with, um, where actually, you know, parents were in charge and children did as they were told. And it feels really galling if they don't. So you might have a tendency to sort of move into being more strict. And of course, with everything in life, um, it's about balance. So what we're looking for is a parenting style that isn't too permissive, or too strict and what that means is about knowing what you want them to do what knowing in advance what you're happy to let slip and what isn't important to you and knowing what is important to you so that if those are the requests that get ignored you know that those are the ones to stand firm and follow up on 
So it's a little bit about knowing about what's important to you. So how do you move towards creating a different cycle? One of the things that I think um, parents of teenagers often get a bit stuck with is when your children are young um, and they are um, they're small, it's natural to decide things for children. You know, we know what the rules are and we enforce them. As, as children get older and move towards teenage years, a more collaborative style of setting rules usually works better. Now, you have to be careful not to give them too much control and know what's important to you. So if you know where your limits are, then you can say to them, look, this is what I want to happen. So an example might be, um, say your 14 year old is going out with friends, but you want to know where they're going. At the moment, you want to know how many of them are and what they're going to do. And you might have a very firm idea about what time you want them home. Now, one way of doing it is just to set it all out with them and say, right, you're only allowed to see three friends. I want you home by six o'clock and, you, you know, you're only allowed to go to the park. I don't want you going anywhere else. Now, as young people get older, they're more likely to kick back and say, uh, you know, they start off with the, well, don't you tell me what to do. You know, I'm going out to meet with my friends. So it's much better if you can get into the habit of saying to them, OK, you know, do the usual stuff about where are you going, who are you seeing? But if you have a very firm idea of what time you want them home, it's to say to them, you know, what what is your plan? And then work with them and say, well, actually, that's that's much later than I'd like you out. You know, I was thinking more about this time. What's going to be the problem with you being back at this time? Let's see if we can find a compromise. Now, you can't compromise on everything. Everybody has their red lines about the kind of things you want to compromise on, and some you'll be much happier compromising on than others. So know where your limits are, hold firm on those and then be flexible within a, a period, uh, you know, within a, uh, a range that you feel comfortable with. Um, if there are some things that feel really important to you, when you set a limit with them, ask them, you know, well, where do you think this might be difficult? What can we do if um, something goes wrong? You're not able to get back at this time or, you know, I don't know, whatever your limit is. It's not unreasonable to ask them to come up with the solutions. It's not always our responsibility to work something out and find the solution. It's perfectly OK to say to them, well, OK, we'll think of something that you think I will agree with. Bring me something I can work with. So to show them that it's a shared responsibility, it's not just about you being mean and harsh. They need to come up with a solution for you as well, not just you uh, flexing to meet their demands. And then once you have an agreement in place, um, if you don't want to get caught into either of those um, cycles, have a think in advance about what is going to happen if that limit isn't met um, and tell them um, and stand firm over it. It's very unhelpful when you as a parent have been really clear about what you expect and then when it's not met, you get wobbly. So try and work it all out in advance so that everybody is clear and then stand firm. And one of the key things about parenting, whatever is going on, is that um, if you can stay calm yourself, everything feels easier. So it's easier said than done, I know. If you're tired, if you're stressed, if you've got a work deadline looming, if you've got other children who are screaming and shouting and demanding your attention in the background, it's really hard to stay calm, but it is OK to take a moment if you feel like your temper is rising or you're feeling upset or you think you might say something you're going to regret. It's it's fine to um, to kind of think about, well, what do I need right now? Do I need to just stop? Say to them, I need a few minutes. I'm getting really cross. I'm just going to go out and I'm going to calm myself down. I'm going to come back. And the reason for doing that is that it's a really good practice to show teenagers that if you can recognise within yourself that you're starting to feel quite cross or emotional, it's OK. It gives them permission to do the same, to go off for a bit, then come back and pick up as long as they do pick up with it and you don't just leave it. Um, and if you are trying to enforce limits around screens or mobile phones or anything like that, try to ensure that you're at least um, 
doing a bit of modeling the same yourself. It's very hard to say to teenagers, you know, you need to spend less time on your phone when they see you glued to yours. So just have a think about what you're asking them to do and make sure that you can model some of those same behaviors yourself to show them that it's more of a family limit. So I've put this up because this is one of the things that quite a few parents are coming to us at the moment to say is that, you know, some teenagers have got very um, settled in lockdown uh, and they've got used to not seeing anybody, not being allowed out of the house so much. And now it's becoming harder to get them up and moving again, or they might feel like they don't really know what to say to anybody because they're not doing very much. You know, they don't have much to talk about. Um, but we know that for teenagers, it's really important to be socially connected and not just online. They do need some face to face contact with peers um, outside school, if preferable, even if it just means half an hour in the park before they come home with a couple of friends. And doing exercise is one of the um, it's one of the first recommendations for low mood or anxiety is just to do some exercise. It's really good for both body and mind. So if if your teen is refusing to do things that they used to do quite easily, try not to. The first thing is try not to nag them or to get into an argument about it. Pick your moment. Wait till you're both feeling really calm and introduce the idea. You could say to them, I've noticed that it seems really hard at the moment for you to um, see your friends and I understand it's really tricky but you know I've noticed that you actually you don't seem to want to see anybody outside school or you used to really do a lot of exercise you used to play football and netball and I know they're not happening at the moment but you don't seem to be um, up for doing any other exercise instead or coming out for a walk with me you know you don't want to um, make too much of it, but you can introduce, just say what you see um, and then ask them about it. As parents, we're very quick to make suggestions, jump in, give advice and say, well, you know, how about doing this? See it first if you can switch it around, um, say what you've seen and then just ask them how they're feeling try and get for them a bit of an understanding about what's going on for them rather than feeling you've got to solve it. Take a step back and just listen. And then um, once you've listened and you've got a bit of an understanding, hopefully, of what's going on, rather than again giving advice and telling them how they could do something dif different, ask them how they're finding it and just say, you know, would you like things to be different? Are you happy with this are you happy the way things are because it doesn't seem to me that you are but I'd like to hear from you and try and have some curiosity about in the way why they're not doing it you know what the reasons are so no advice until you've completely understood it all and try and say show some real empathy for their position and really listen to what they're finding hard or struggling with then again instead of giving advice sit down together and just say, well, should we have a think together? You know, um, I understand that it might be difficult to make big changes if you've got very used to not doing any of this, but let's see if we can break it down a bit and see if we can just do a little bit more or introduce a bit of exercise or seeing if there are some ways in which you could have some con more contact with friends and get them to meet you with it. So it's not just you giving advice and them saying, well, no, I don't know, maybe that maybe that might work. Try and get them to think with you together so that you're collaboratively problem solving and listening to their ideas. You will have to have so if they find it hard to get started, you might have to have some ideas, but pitch them as ideas rather than things that are definitely going to work. So if we have a bit of a think about um, what low mood might look like, lots of parents are worried about um, teenagers, whether it's just a passing thing or whether it's something to actually be uh, concerned about. Low mood or depression, it is more than normal ups and downs of sadness, feeling bad. Teenagers do have a bit of a roller coaster of emotions. 
and um, it's normal for them to go up and down quite a bit and to even feel quite despondent at times. The difference with depression is that it goes further than that and some of the things you might want to listen out for if they seem really hopeless about the future that's always a bit of a worry you know if they're giving lots of general statements about the future or just saying you know about a lot of things what's the point or you know um, if they're expressing feelings of just having no worth um, that's always a bit of an issue one of the big pointers are that they stop doing activities that they used to find enjoyable or they're just doing them but they seem like they're going through the motions they're not really enjoying them in the same way that they used to perhaps a bit of a social withdrawal there might be some thoughts about death or what the meaning of life is and um, what i mean by flat affect on the slide means that um, they just don't seem to have such big highs and lows uh, as they usually would do. Everything is just a bit flat. They're just on a very um, even keel, but not in a good way. Um, it's normal to have ups and downs. And if it feels like they're just not having many of the ups, then that might be something to watch out for. And all of these things um, in their own right are not something necessarily to be worried about. Uh, where, let's move on to the next slide, where you might want to be more concerned is if it's, if you can see these changes over a sustained period of time, so more than just the odd day, it really needs to be over a number of weeks at least, um, and usually these signs are consistent over multiple settings. They might be able to temporarily distract themselves. So lots of parents say, but I see them laughing and joking while they're on the Xbox playing with friends. Well, that's just distraction. You know, um, be really worried if they didn't have anything that distracted them. But then when they come off it, they sort of slip back into a sort of bit of a listless way of being or they just don't seem themselves. So all the things that I've got up here are things to watch out for. But the main thing um, are if you see something that is quite a change from their usual way of being. So most he uh, most teenagers are quite labile in mood, you know, they go up and down. But um, and some some people are naturally more introverted or extroverted than others. But if you see a change from the norm and it lasts and they just don't seem to be engaging in things the way they usually would, that's when to maybe think about getting a bit of extra help. And by extra help, I mean talking to school. Schools have a huge number of um, of different things they can recommend. They might have a school counsellor, they might have some support from a mental health um, team, which are the teams that we run. Um, you know, there are lots of options, or you can go to your GP, or most, um, I think every borough actually has a single point of access where parents can um, refer children if they're really worried about them, and then somebody will look it over and talk to you to get an understanding. But first port of call usually would be the school. School have access to quite a lot of interventions now and can just give something to or recommend something that might be helpful. So if we're to think a little bit about anxiety next. Um, oh OK, I've got here how can parents help. So with low mood, if we just jump back a little bit with low mood, one of the things you can do before rushing to get extra help, of course, is just try and up the time you spend with your child. Um, they might not want to be with you, but just making space for them and letting them know that you've seen something different. So let them know that you think they're struggling a bit and just say, you know, you just don't seem quite yourself. How are you feeling? Um, I'd really like to spend a bit more time with you. And again, it's about listening, empathising and trying to understand what's going on for them without leaping in with advice or giving them great ideas about what they could be doing. Do try not to nag them, but if they are spending a lot more time than usual up in their room on their own, insist on having some family time together every evening, particularly at the moment when everybody's at home. You know, family meals or some TV time together. And if they are struggling to exercise or do any activities, then 
try and do things with them or get their siblings to do something with them, you know, and have a think about what might they might actually want to engage in. So going for a walk is always, um, you know, particularly if you've got a dog or you can borrow a friend's dog, that's something that usually might help get them up and out. But see if there are a few things that you can engage with rather than nagging them to do something on their own, which they're not likely to do. OK, so now we are going to move on to looking at anxiety. So in order to kind of test out how anxious your teenager is feeling at the moment and whether to be worried about it or not, it's good to start by just trying to understand why we feel anxious. Now, anxiety is a really normal feeling. We'd be in a lot of trouble if we never felt anxious. For example, if we cross the road without feeling some anxiety or some warning system, um, you know, we wouldn't last long before we were hit by a car. So everybody needs some anxiety, you perform better in exams with a little bit of anxiety. But what we don't want is too much where it feels paralysing or it's getting in the way of doing things that we would otherwise want to do. So to understand anxiety, I've got up on the screen what we call the anxiety equation. And anxiety rises when you feel like something is, is going to be quite fear inducing. You feel like it's going to be much worse than maybe it actually is going to be. And you're looking at all the downsides of it. So it feels threatening, it feels dangerous. Combined with that, if you feel like if it is that bad, you won't be able to cope with it, you can see why anxiety would rock it. So anxiety can be summed up with it by an overestimation of how bad something is going to be, combined with an underestimation of how well you might cope with it if it is difficult. And so some examples of things that um, children or older teenagers might say is if you hear statements around it'll be a disaster you know nobody's going to want me to be there they're all going to ignore me you know i'm never going to get a job um you know i'm going to fail all my exams combined with um sort of poor coping statements like i just can't do it you know it's impossible i won't manage it i can't do that there's no way i'll be able to do it you know, I just don't want to even try. So some of those things are normal teenage things to say, but if they get the two combined together, then it's understandable that anxiety is going to be higher. Now, some teenagers will tell you that they're feeling anxious. They'll just say, I feel so stressed. I feel so anxious about it. Others won't. They don't often tell their parents, but it might bubble up in their behaviour. So what to watch out for? Uh, you know, in their behaviour. Now, there isn't one obvious way that people react when they're anxious. For some people, anxiety, if you're feeling high anxiety or stress, you might withdraw into yourself and just really close down a bit. For other teens, what might happen is that they feel really like they're on the edge and one small thing just tips them over. And it might be that they get tearful um, or really upset at small things that you just think, well, why on earth are they getting upset with this? Or it might be that it trips into anger. So they might be more aggressive, they might have outbursts, they might shout more, and they just might look like they're more on edge. Uh, they might say some really difficult things to you, a few hurtful things. And so it's really about understanding what is normal for your teenager. And if they tip into doing any of these things that feel out of character, that might be a time to uh, find a calm moment and just ask them how they're doing and if there's anything that they're feeling concerned about or you know that you've noticed that they seem really on edge or really really withdrawn and the other thing I haven't come to which is on the slide is that they might start asking lots of questions and looking for reassurance so you might hear lots of what if questions you know um, what if my mind goes blank in the exam? What if I can't do it? What if it all goes wrong? What if I don't get any GCSEs? What if I can't get a job? And it might spiral with lots of what if thinking that essentially is catastrophizing, sort of jumping straight to the worst possible scenario uh, and focusing on that. So those are some of the things to watch out for. 
As a parent, um, we are drawn to wanting to protect our children. It's a natural instinct for for parents to if you see your child being distressed or um, feeling upset or you know that they're struggling with something, we want to respond to it. And one of the ways in which parents quite often do that is to jump into reassurance mode. It'll be fine. Don't worry, you're going to do really well. You will be fine. Look, you're doing lots of work. It will be OK. Um, now, the danger with doing too much of that is it just becomes background noise if you do it all the time and it doesn't end up reassuring them or on the flip side they can become quite dependent on it so they'll look to you for you know to tell them that it's going to be okay and what we want is that for them to learn to evaluate the situation for themselves so we don't we can't always be there as parents to reassure and provide guidance what we want them to be able to do is think well, hang on a minute. How did I do last time I had an exam? What helped me? What got me through? What can I manage for myself? You know, and so the way we can do that and help them get to that stage is to ask some questions about it and just say, OK, so if you were to break this down, what do you think might help? Last time you were in a similar situation, how did you get through it? What resources did you pull on? Who supported you? How much did you prepare for it? So try and help them work out themselves what's been helpful. The other thing that parents often get really drawn into doing is inadvertently colluding with their child wanting to avoid things. So if you think about scenarios that you or yourself feel anxious about, quite often we'll put them off, we'll procrastinate. Nobody really wants to do something that's going to make them feel bad. So avoidance is a very normal response to anxiety, but it's also not a particularly helpful one because if you avoid all the things you feel scared about, you never learn that actually they might not be as bad as you think they're going to be and that actually you might cope with them quite well. So you don't learn from experience. If anything, the more you avoid something, the worse it becomes in your head. And this is the same for teenagers. So if you step in too much to protect them and just say well, it was all right, you don't have to do it. You're not giving them that chance to learn from experience that actually it could be OK and maybe they will manage it better than they think. What you don't want to do is push them so hard that you ramp up the anxiety to a huge level and they become paralysed. So it is balance. It's about pushing enough, but also not overloading them. So if they, if you do see them having a go at anything that you know makes them feel bad or provokes anxiety, do notice it. Give them a bit of praise. You don't have to go over the top, but you can just say, I saw you give that a go, you know, um, that's quite a big deal given that I know you really didn't want to do it and I'm proud of you for having a try or I'm proud of you for pushing yourself. Um, if it feels like it's just too much for them to do in one go, help them think about, well, how can you break it down? Let's think this is something that really makes you feel anxious. Are there a few bits you can do of it? You don't have to do the whole thing, but how about you just go for, I don't know, see how it would be, go for 15 minutes or try it for a short amount of time. Um, and encourage them to break down big steps into smaller ones and um, be there to celebrate when they manage those small steps and talk with them about how that's how you build up into doing something bigger or getting there. So what are some of the practical things that parents can really do to help teenagers while everything is so up in the air? And for all of us as parents, it's worth noting, noting that actually these aren't easy times for anybody. There is a lot of uncertainty around. We don't know at the moment kind of where government guidelines are going to go next. We've got a long winter in front of us where we don't know if we're going to be able to see family. We don't know what we're going to be allowed to do. But there are things for both yourself and your children that you can do practically that will help things feel a little bit more certainty at more certain and one of the ways of um, trying to feel a bit better when everything around you feels up and down is just to have a bit of a plan so to know what you can do Gosh, is it stuck again? I'm so sorry I don't know why it's doing this okay excellent 
So as parents, we are natural teachers for our children. When they're little, we teach them how to, you know, we teach them how to speak, we teach them how to walk, we teach them how to do things. And we're very much in the role of home teachers when kids are little. It's quite difficult to step out of that mo mode as they get older. And actually you shouldn't, you are still teaching them things, but they're a bit less receptive to hearing mm -hmm. or teaching as they get older. And certainly for teenagers, when parents parents give advice or point out what they're doing wrong in order for them to um, learn from their mistakes. What they hear is they don't hear the teaching, they hear it as criticism. Um, and so one of the ways to kind of step back from inadvertently criticising them, um, even if you're trying to teach them how to how to learn from what's gone wrong, is to um, separate out what they're doing from them as a person. So it's very easy if you feel frustrated with your child, it's very easy to say things like, gosh, you're just so lazy. Why can't you do X, you know, or, you know, you're always so messy and we can jump in and effectively when we're talking about behaviour, we end up labelling the whole child. And the reason that's not very helpful is because it doesn't give them much room to move um, or move on. If you are a lazy person, it's much uh, harder to get out of that. Whereas if you can just say, you know, that behaviour drives me mad because it makes me feel like you don't care or it makes me feel like you're not putting in some effort, that is much easier to work with because it's around one behaviour that focuses the area for change. If you're labelling the whole child, it's very hard to move on when somebody says you are X. And if you think about it for yourself, when it feels global, you can either end up feeling angry, which loses the focus on the behaviour because you're just angry about what's being said, or you end up feeling just a bit resigned to it, just going, oh great, you know, maybe I am, or they don't understand me. And again, it moves the it moves the focus from the behaviour that you would like them to change. Um, the other thing that I think parents often get um, pulled into are just general labels. So we might say when children are little, we might say, oh, yeah, she's the shy one or he's the one who's good at maths or, um, you know, she really struggles with X. And we kind of we have our own ideas about what our children are good at and what they're not good at. He's the sporty one. She's the musical one. Again, try not to label them in this way, um, partly because um, if you can see it here, um, children do move into the categories we assign to them. And so if that's your understanding and that's what you're inadvertently kind of focusing on or looking for, that's what they'll move into. And that might be at the detriment of other skills or other abilities or just allowing them to have more focus on what they want to get into and I think if you're struggling to motivate your teenager quite often what parents will do is they'll make comparisons so they'll um, you know if a friend if you hear from uh, another teenager's parent that they're really working hard and they're doing lots of revision you might say you might point it out to your own child and you might say um, you know, I was talking to so and so's mum and she says he's working really hard on his GCSEs. You know, you need to do a bit more as well. If you do that, then you might you might do better. And actually all it does is breed resentment. Um, or if you say, uh, I mean, an example that parents often use with smaller kids is they'll say, look at so and so eating all their beans, you know, in the hope that their child will follow on and do the same. Well, actually, it doesn't tend to work very well occasionally with very small children, but comparisons tend to backfire and then they tend to um, get pushed back on you. And teenagers will say to you, well, I'm not him, I'm not her, leave me alone, I'm my own person. And you tend to get into an argument. So try and pull back from anything that's comparative, labelling. Um, and there is a time for teaching 
children and pointing out what they're doing wrong in order for them to learn from it. But it's very rarely in the moment. It's usually afterwards in a reflective space. So there's a good um, it's good sometimes to think about, even if you're trying to teach your children, how receptive are they to hearing that teaching in the moment? Because they might take it as just criticism. There we are. So first steps, how can you do something different so you get don't get caught in some of these cycles? Um, you the first thing to do is really to think about what you're feeling yourself and really try and keep yourself calm because as I've said before if you're calm as a parent um, it does change things you can do, you automatically feel more in control if you're managing your own emotions and then it gives you a bit if it's easier to think it's easier to think about what you want to do it's also much harder for your teenager to pick a fight with you if you're not meeting them in that fight. If you're refusing to argue and refusing to join them in the escalation, it's quite hard to argue to yourself. Um, so the first thing is to try and just keep on top of your own emotions and to notice what you're feeling. Um, next stage is to really try and put yourself in your child's shoes and really think about what might be going on for them. And as a parent, it's very easy when you hear or you see your child struggling with something to think um, either, oh yeah, that's just, you know, I can remember when I was a teenager um, or, you know, oh yeah, it was just like that for me or, you know, I've heard about so-and-so who did it X. And it's very easy to kind of get drawn into thinking of solutions or thinking about how you felt when you were their age. And actually that might not be at all what they're thinking. So try and hold off from doing that and try and really focus on what's going on for them. You know, what, what is this all about? And you won't necessarily know. But what you can do is attend to the emotion that you see. So you can say things like, you look really upset or, you know, um, that sounds really difficult or if you know what what has happened you can just do a bit of empathy and say well yeah I understand if that happened to me I think I would feel the same um, so really try and tune in to what's going on to their side now it is quite difficult if you're feeling annoyed with them or you're worried about them not to just jump in with those feelings but if you can take a step back actually it cuts down a lot of the uh, confrontation or difficult dialogue with a teenager if they feel like you're on their side rather than just trying to tell them what to do or tell them they're doing it wrong or give advice then you've got them and they're much more likely to then really tell you what's going on rather than just provoke an argument so just a couple of slides more and then I'm going to take some questions. Um, one of the things that all children do, but particularly teenagers, is they will really give it to you. So they will either say things to you like you're the worst parent ever or I really, really hate you. Get out of my face. They'll come out with some really strong statements. But the other things they'll do is they will quite often give you global kind of negatives or global statements of high emotion. So they might say things like, you know, it's all rubbish. Chemistry is pointless. What's the point of doing it? You know, or I can't bear it anymore. Nothing is good in my life. You know, everything is rotten. All my friends hate me. They'll come out with quite big things sometimes. And for most parents, that's quite anxiety provoking. Well, actually, it goes one of two ways. Either parents get quite um, focused on what their child is saying and think, oh my God, this is awful. You know what's going on for them, you know, and they get quite worried about what their child is saying or some parents do the opposite and they say, oh, it's so dramatic. You know, honestly, everything's all drama and you might be quite dismissive of it and just roll your eyes a bit and think, oh, here we go. If you can try and tune in to what's going on for them, Actually, you might not know what's going on underneath, but what you can do is tune into the emotion and try and not take it as a global statement. So sometimes 
if um, if they come out with a statement like, God, all my friends hate me or my friends are all mean or, you know, nobody, nobody likes me or, you know, I'm useless at, at um, work. Actually, what they might be referring to is an incident that's happened today. So what they might be trying to say is actually I fell out with my friends today. But what they're tuning into is this big kind of overblown statement about all oh, my friends hate me. So if you can hold on to the fact that it might not be that everything is wrong, but it might be that something has gone on. That's a useful starting point. Um, and holding back from what we usually do as adults when um, children or teenagers give us these big statements. So what adults are usually drawn into doing are doing for things. You might refute it and you might say to them, but I know that's not right. You've got really good friends or you do well in exams. Um, you know, uh, you've got it all wrong and you might try and tell them why they're wrong or give them evidence for why they're wrong. You might go into question mode where you want to know more. It might be triggering for you that you think, actually, I just need to understand what's going on. So you say, what's going on? Why? When did it happen? You know, how uh, how are you feeling? And you might go into trying to draw out lots of details. Um, you might try and persuade them out of the mood. You might do that by giving evidence. You know, last week you wrote a great essay. You've got friends you've known since primary school. They all really think you're great. You might try and distract them as a way of persuading them out. It'll say, come on, let's go and do something else. Let's, um, you know, let's go and do this together. So you might try and really just move them on from whatever they're feeling. Or the perennial favourite for the parents is you might give advice. Oh, well, why don't you try this? Or how about doing that? If you can step back from all those standard responses that we all do as parents and sit with what's going on and just try and think a little bit and think, uh, see what you say, uh, say what you see, you know, and have a think about what might your child be feeling? And just think maybe it's not quite as big, but I'm, something has happened. They're not feeling great. Let's let's sit with this. And that might be as simple as just saying something that is fairly uncontroversial, but just shows them that you're trying to understand their position. So you might just say it looks like, you know, sounds like you're having a hard time or if they're ranting a little bit or kind of slouching around a bit you can just say looks like you've got some really difficult feelings going on um or you could emphasize empathize by saying things like well no wonder you're frustrated or gosh yeah you do seem really cross about it or you might just say um how can i help what do you need? That would be the only time where you could actually ask a question when you put it back to them rather than giving advice. But that idea of just sitting with what they're bringing you means that then again, they're more likely to open up and tell you about what's going on if they feel like you're not probing or trying to persuade them out of it or telling them that they're wrong, um, that they shouldn't be feeling what they're feeling. Just sit with it and see if you can give them a bit of um, empathy and understanding. Um, and it can do wonders for just meaning that they, you know, they, they, they actually look upon you as somebody who might be able to tolerate just listening. And that's quite a skill to have being a parent because we're all busy, we're all pushed for time. Uh, but if you can just take a moment, you don't necessarily have to do much else. Just acknowledge it and refrain from doing the normal. That might be enough just for them to come back later and tell you a bit about what's going on. So now I'm going to come out of the slideshow 